In the next two chapters, we will have look on color management, materials workflow, color range, dynamic range and ACES. Rendering is complex process which needs correct pipeline and color management. As example, here is render which is using proper color management. And here is how looks render with incorrect color management. As you can see, result is not the same. And in the second example, I will show you how looks result with correct texture linearization for materials properties and now without proper linearization. Again, as you can see it produces different looking result, even textures are the same and geometry is the same as well. But without proper linearization and color management, materials properties are not able to produce correct result. So in this chapter I will show you what steps you have to follow if you would like to avoid all these mistakes. I will start with the basic scheme. We have four types of texture or maps. sRGB textures are using sRGB color space and control material colors such as diffuse color, reflection color or emission color. Grayscale textures represents data and control material properties such as roughness, bump, ambient occlusion, displacement or metalness. Normal map is RGB texture, which is using red, green and blue channel for X, Y and Z transformation. Grayscale textures and normal maps for correct result need to be interpreted as linear. That's the reason why in Redshift Texture node for grayscale and normal texture you have to enable Gamma Override option. The most common format for sRGB, grayscale or normal texture is 8-bit JPEG. But some texture artists are using for their texture exports also PNG or even T format. Next texture category are EXR maps. EXR is using linear color space and is able to store high dynamic range data. So it's ideal format for HDRI maps or high quality 32-bit displacement maps. Now I will show you why we need linearize, normal map and grayscale textures. On the first graph you can see how works the linear workflow. As example, if I will have input which contains grayscale texture with 50% of gray, correct numerical output value supposed to be 0.5. But as you can see on the second graph, if I am using sRGB texture or gamma encoded texture, I am not able to have equivalent numerical output anymore. This nonlinear workflow works properly for sRGB textures which represents colors such as diffuse, specular or emission. But if I would like to avoid wrong color space interpretation for normal maps and grayscale textures which represents data, I have to use gamma override option in texture node for all textures which are not representing colors. And that's the main reason why I have to mark for redshift over gamma override option that this is grayscale texture on normal map which represents data. And after that, as you can see on the graph, gamma override with value 1.0 works the same way as linear workflow, so it produces correct values for material properties exactly as we need. In case that I don't want to use gamma override in texture node, or this option is not available. Another way how to linearize gamma encode textures is to use gamma color correction 2.2. And as you can see on third graph, final result after this gamma correction is theoretically again linear gamma curve with value 1.0. Theoretically, it means that gamma correction 2.2 is the average number for correction, which is supposed to be a little bit more complex. 
but as you can see on the curves comparison, these differences are close to minimum, so you do not need to be worried about it. My recommendation for you is to use mainly Gamma Override in Texture Node, instead Gamma Color Correction 2.2. Main reason why I am using Gamma Color Correction 2.2 is just for better visibility, where we need linearization and where we don't. And also it shows second option, how to handle color based nodes, which doesn't contain Gamma Override option like textures. As example, if I am using Maxon Noise, Constant Color or Round Node, to control material properties such as roughness or displacement, and I would like to have physically correct result, I have to linearize color-based nodes, because color-based nodes using sRGB color space. As example how it works, I will show you on the round node, which contains three steps, black color, 50% of gray and white color. As you can see with how Gamma Correction 2.2, differences between these three equal steps produce nonlinear result. But in case that I will use Gamma Correction 2.2, immediately I can see correct result. So now differences between black color and 50% of gray are equal to differences between 50% of gray and white color. Also remember that displacement textures are mostly exported in the way where 50% of gray supposed to be ground or middle level. And in this case I have to change displacement range. Displacement new range mean minus 0.5 and max 0.5 will correctly consider ground level. So as you can see now we have correct result. For more details how works displacement and how properly set up displacement tag, check out our displacement chapter. And here is one more time comparison why we need correct gamma override for textures which control material properties. As you can see, textures without proper gamma override produce different looking reflections, roughness, bump and displacement. Let's go back to our main scheme. As next step we have materials which are processing data from textures. Materials using two different workflows. Specular or metalness. If you are using specular workflow you have textures such as diffuse, specular and glossiness. But if you are using metalness workflow you have textures such as base color, metallic and roughness. So as you can see here is another important factor where you have to follow rules for correct result. As example here is how looks output template from Substance Painter. PBR Metal Rough represents metalness workflow. So here you can see name of all textures which belongs to metalness workflow. Include their color space and formats as well. If I will choose PBR Spec Gloss, I will be able to see name of the textures which belongs to specular workflow, include their color space and format. And here is comparison how different is texture contribution in specular and metalness workflow. First example is plastic material. If I would like to have the same result in both workflows, as you can see I need textures which contains proper data for each workflow. In specular workflow I have two sRGB maps which controls base material color, diffuse and specular. In metalness workflow base material color controls only one sRGB map. As next step you can see that glossiness is inverted roughness. And as next step you can see that if I would like to match IOR value from specular workflow, I have to increase reflectivity parameter in metalness workflow. Second example is metallic material. 
Metallic materials in specular workflow contains black diffuse texture. That's the main reason why specular workflow needs two sRGB textures for correct base color. And as next step you can see that if I would like to match metallic look from metalness workflow, I have to use IOR value 0 in specular workflow. For even more details on how works specular and metalness workflow, include how to correctly connect all exported textures into the RS material, you can check out our specular versus metalness workflow chapter. So as you can see in our main scheme, as first step is important correctly set up textures for redshift, and as second step to understand where to connect these textures in correspondent material workflow. As next step, is Rechiv ready to process all geometry, textures, materials, HDRI maps, and lights together? For this process, it is recommended to use linear workflow. And as last step, for correct and consistent color management, we have to correctly choose display color space, because every single monitor or display using built-in color profile which allows us to preview final result. So if this monitor calibrated to sRGB color profile, I suppose to use for correct display preview sRGB profile option. In case that my monitor has a wider gamut for OCIO or is calibrated as REC709 color profile, you can choose these color profiles instead. More information about OCIO I will show you in the next chapter include ACES workflow. As next step, I will show you how to correctly set up last two steps inside C4D and Redshift. If I will go to the main menu, Edit, Project Settings, I will have access to section where I can specify what kind of workflow will be used for computing or rendering. As I said already, for processing data inside C4D and Redshift is recommended linear workflow. Input color profile is recommended as RGB. So keep this default C4D project settings and all steps which I explained in this chapter will work properly. But in case that you will change these options, you also will change rules for processing textures or computing data. So steps which I explain in this chapter will need different rules as well. So if you are experienced artist which is able to understand all these rules, you can use any kind of workflow which correctly works for your pipeline. But in case that you have just basic knowledge about color management and redshift workflow, keep these default workflow options and follow all steps as I explained already in this chapter. Last step what we have to do in this chapter is correctly set up display mode in color management section of Redshift. If I will go to Redshift render view settings, I will have access to color management section. And here I can choose what kind of color profile is using my monitor or display for correct preview. In the next chapter, we will have look on color range, dynamic range and ACES workflow.